Hi there. Been a while. I know most of you are here for the guide portion of the video, and I know there are really convenient chapters in the description or on the little video bar, but this intro is really short and pretty important, so just hear me out for like 30 seconds. First of all, this guide is not necessarily meant to help you optimize the railway, since optimization can vary wildly between players, and there are a ton of different strategies you can use to get your turn count down, so it would be impossible to list them all here. Secondly, I'll be detailing my personal experiences with the railway so far. So my biased opinions on railway will be detailed in full throughout and especially at the end of this video. So just be wary of that. Lastly, this video might be a little bit more ranty than my other videos and I do apologize for that, but if this poll is to be believed, that is what you all want anyways. I'll be starting by going through the team I brought to railway and some other IDs I would highly recommend. The ego I would say are essential, and then I'll explain the railway's mechanics, and lastly, every fight in railway. Intro is done now, here's past Esku to explain his team. Thanks for the fantastic intro, Esku of the future. Now, let me disclaim that this team I used is not optimal by any means. It goes to show that you do not need to run the absolute meta IDs to complete the railway or get under 200 turns. You can see the team I used on screen, but for you audio listeners, my team was, in order, Spice Bushy Sang, and Faust, Sank Don, Warp Ryoshu, Rhino Merceau, Ting Tang Hong Lu, Rabbit Heathcliff, Molar Boatworks Ishmael, Base Rodian, and Claire, Seven Otis, and Zvi Gregor. Not only is this team not quite optimal, but I also threw it together like six minutes before going into Railway because it came out on the same day I posted my video buffing the worst IDs. So I was exhausted from editing, and frankly, I hadn't been thinking about the Railway. But let me explain why each ID is on this team and what made me go with it as a whole. Spicebush and Enfaust are just strong IDs. I think Spicebush is a pretty self-explanatory ID to bring, as he is just generally strong and the best Yi Sang ID, but Enfaust is more a matter of preference, and lack of knowledge to an extent. I didn't have 7 Faust at the time, but you really could run either one. 7 Faust has slightly higher numbers and fuels Fluid Sack better, but I am an Enfaust enjoyer through and through. However, Lobotomy Faust is a fitting replacement as well. And it's perhaps more optimal if you wish to burst enemies down with Hexnail, but I'll talk about that in the Ego section. Sank Dawn stands out like a sore thumb on my team. Since W Dawn is so hard meta for this railway, it's disgusting. Simply put, I didn't want to use W Dawn. I made a whole video talking about charge and why I don't like using it, so using Sank Dawn instead, an ID I really like, was a no-brainer for me. This is also the only ID I uptied to 4 specifically for this railway, since having a strong skill 1 clasher is really important due to another mechanic present in railway that we will talk about. Warp Ryoshu is simply an insane ID. Her damage is almost unmatched, with the only thing bringing her down being a relatively weak skill 1. Out of everyone on this team I used, this is the only ID I would say absolutely needs the uptie 4 to perform as well as she does. The extra coin power on the skill 3 means fights go down way faster, and the extra clashing on Leap can make a difference. Rhino Merceau was an easy bench warmer choice. Most Merceau IDs are not going to do very well for anything besides using Pursuance, which to be honest is really good in this railway, since healing is limited and living is based. You can absolutely run Rhino or Warp Merceau, but I benched Rhino for his passive, which gives more max speed to IDs with charge. Ting Tang Hong Lu was another easy choice for me, and another one whose uptie 4 I would recommend, though not to the extent of Warp Ryoshu. Again, strong skill ones, especially for clashing, are really useful here. Combine that with Shank's insane damage, and Mutilate's ability to win every check you throw it at, and Ting Tang is a very solid option for the railway. Of course, K Kor Hong Lu is a great option, Kurakumo Hong Lu is also an option because numbers are not that high in the railway, I just prefer Ting Tang. Rabbit Heathcliff. Quick Suppression. Section done. Muller Ishmael is almost objectively suboptimal. Uptie 4 Reindeer Ishmael is a beast, with her skill 1 being insanely strong both for clashing and damage, and there's also Mind Whip. So if you have that, use her. She will do very well. That being said, Muller Ishmael or even She Ishmael are both fantastic options, though again, less optimal. I think She Ishmael can be used as a very solid ID for players who lack other options, since she is given to you completely for free, and her skill 2 will do insanely well on some specific fights. Base Rodian is here for her passive, giving the highest HP ID 20% more damage on heads coins. This is really useful to speed you up a little bit. That said, since this video has taken so long to come out and I have been sick, Daiichi Rodian is a better option if you want to speed up the blunt weak fights. Rose Spanner will also do well, but Daiichi seems insanely strong. 
Enclair is another obvious choice, but don't fret newer players who don't have him, I do not think he is as hard required as you might think. Mostly because his skill 1 is bad. Balancing him out to be just good on a few fights, but not essential. Seven Otis is there for her passive. The highest speed ally deals 10% more damage when dealing weak or fatal damage. Truthfully, you can swap this out to whichever passive you choose, but for my run, I decided to have it be 7 Otis in case I needed a decent backup ID. Then there's Spy Gregor. You can run G Gregor for the passive and in battle if you prefer, but I find that the tankiness, speed, and slash skills on Zvi Gregor make him very good for one fight in particular, as well as being a solid all-rounder. Okay, huh. that is a general overview for the team I brought. You do not have to bring this team, in fact I would recommend just going all in on charge. W Dawn over Sank Dawn, and Ranger Ishmael over Molar Boatworks Ishmael. Then the team becomes a lot more damaging and solid all around. But again, I do believe, and kind of know, this railway is beatable with almost any IDs, so long as you can get past the first couple of fights and know what you are doing. Sinking is also incredibly potent, with Threadspin 4, Rhymeshank, and Daiichi Rodian, or any Rodian really, plus Muller Ishmael and Spice Bushy Sang. The only problem is missing out on Reindeer Ishmael for some other fights, but if you already have these IDs and things you need for them uptide and or Threadspun, then the Sinking will be very good for you. Outside of that, you can still get creative and succeed with any team, but those two teams really are the best way to do this as fast and efficiently as possible if you want to get low turn counts. Now let's talk Ego. To cover my bases, the more Ego you have, the better. And there are a lot of Ego that can make you have an easier time, but these three are the ones I would say stand above the rest for this content in particular. Fluid Sack, Pursuance, and Hexnail. That's about it, really. Funnily enough, you don't even really need Dawn Telepole due to one of the buffs you can choose. I would highly recommend you get at least one healing ego though, even if that is Soda Hong Lu somehow, and build your team to make sure you can fuel it well. You will take chip damage as you go through Railway, so having a way to heal that off is going to be pretty necessary. Hexnail is here because it's really good if you want to lower your turn count, and Elfaust is the best user of it. Envy is an easy resource to maintain on most teams really, so her not fueling it super well is whatever. But the main thing is the fragility it applies is same turn, and Elfaus can go very fast via her skill too, ensuring the most value out of it. Now I know what you're gonna say. Esku, what about Rhymeshake? Didn't you mention that it was so good? Well it is, for one specific team. If Rhymeshank was more useful overall, without the sinking support, which it is good damage of course, but Rhymeshank is only especially good when you build a team around it. These three Ego are good on almost any team. Hexnail you can kind of make an argument, but the thing is if you're trying to go fast, you're going to be using those big Envy nukes, at least one of them, and Quickspression probably has the best synergy because it is Envy and Pierce, so you get the full 4 fragile value out of Quick Suppression. I'll now briefly talk about the mechanics inherent to this railway specifically. So things are a little different from the first railway. Instead of a straight shot, you have four different points where you will reset and go back to the beginning. Those are, after the first three stations, then again after you clear to the fourth station, then again after the sixth station, then the seventh. After that, a full cycle is only completed after doing all eight stations. After each of these cycles, enemies will gain plus one offense and defense level, as well as deal 10% more damage. You will also be made to choose a team buff and an enemy debuff. By debuff, I mean buff to the enemies. That's confusing wording. Anyways, the optimal choice can vary wildly based on your team composition, but the debuffs are more objective. There are five debuffs you'll be able to choose from. Opportunistic, which boosts the enemy offense level by three if they took no HP damage in a turn. Shield damage does not count. Hardening, which increases max HP by 15% and makes all enemies have plus one slot weight, meaning AoE is less effective. Accelerating is plus 1 to max speed. Inhaling increases HP healed from skill effects by 30%, and makes it so every hit heals by 8% of damage dealt. Then Thirsting, which makes every Ego cost plus 1 resources. Let me explain some things about these debuffs, and the best order to tank them in, in my opinion. Opportunistic is the best one to take first by far. This should only trigger on a few fights, and is not too punishing, though plus 1 clash power over you can be problematic. Personally, I took Accelerating as my second debuff, and I think that it is a good choice. Plus 1 to max speed is not too big of a deal, so long as you're not using it completely slow IDs. 
If it does end up being a problem on the first turn, you can always retry the fight and abnormalities will change targets, meaning being faster than you is not that much of an issue. Next is either inhaling or thirsting. Personally, I chose thirsting. The plus one to ego resources consumed means that for an ego like Hexnail, which has only one sin affinity, it only costs one more. But for something like Yi Sang Sun Shower, which is 10 usually, it costs four more, since it costs four different kinds of sins. This can be problematic, but I recommend saving your ego for the later cycles anyways, and using their early floors to build up as much as possible. Though, do not hesitate to use ego if you need to. Then, on your next cycle, either take inhaling or thirsting, whichever of the two you did not pick. Inhaling is only really a problem on two fights. It is negligible most everywhere else, so long as you are simply not getting hit. Hardening is pretty terrible. But if you aren't going for speed, you can honestly afford to take this before inhaling if you are scared of Fey Lantern and Wayward Passenger, who we will get into shortly. I personally took Hardening as my fourth debuff, and still managed to get well below 200, so the safer play is Hardening I would say, though it does slow you down, which can lead to its own problems. For sub 150, take Hardening last. So those are all the debuffs. But before we finally talk about the fights, we need to talk about an elephant in the room. Why are skill 1s so important? Well, your skills and speed carry over to the next fights. This for some reason has made it so you kind of have two decks of skills, and two decks of skills means more skill 1s, and you cannot reset to get rid of them. This is why having high rolling skill 1s is so nice, or having good evades to replace those skill 1s, since having a dashboard with no skill 2s or 3s is very possible. You can also just use Ego, of course, but a reliable skill one as a backup will serve you very well to save those resources. Remember, at some point, they will cost one more. Alright, I hope that is every mechanic you need to know explained. Let's get into the first fight, so that no one will cry. First of all, for all of these fights, I'll mostly be talking about the first time you fight them, as most of them do not change significantly the next times you come around to them. So, cycle zero so no one will cry. Refraction Railway 2 starts off immediately with its hardest fight. I am not joking. Fighting so no one will cry with zero sanity is brutal. You may not think this for the first few turns, but as soon as you do the abnormality check, he will unleash three brutally powerful gloom skills on you that are nearly impossible to clash with without ego. There are ways to make this fight not nearly as scary, but let me explain exactly what he does first. He applies these talismans to you upon using his attacks. These are mostly harmless until they stack up to 9, at which point they will give you 2 attack power down. So read his skill descriptions to see how many of them he will apply to you and be wary of getting that high. Eventually, he will use 3 guard skills and gain a lot of protection. During this time, you want to attack his guards with your allies that have the highest talismans. This will get rid of the talismans on you and apply them to the talisman doll. You really want to apply at least 12 Cursed Talismans. If you pass the Abnormality check that follows, you will apply 5 more, but you likely will not eat it, though it is nice. If you do apply 12 Cursed Talismans, he will gain a massive amount of attack power down. 5 per part. And his scary skill becomes a little less scary. Now, this doesn't make his skill, so that no one will cry, a joke. This skill can, and will still, fuck you up. The name of the game is Sanity. I would recommend Enfaust for this fight in particular if nothing else. If your team composition can support 4 lust skills, Whistles will bring 2 of your sinners up by 15 sanity. If you cannot do this, putting Enfaust on the bench means that you only need 3 lust resonance, though it will only hit 1 sinner. Prioritize getting those sinners to as high sanity as possible, then pray you have a skill that can beat his in a clash once the time comes. Alternatively, you can play to build up Faust Fluid Sack, which is just an incredible ego all around for this railway, obviously. Alternatively, alternatively, you can just try to build up any ego that has a high floor. With the debuffs applied, the So That No One Will Cry skill can roll a maximum of 17, but you can almost always count on him missing at least one of his plus one coins. Most every ego will be able to reliably clash with this, but always be sure to check his offense level to see if it will grant him more clash power against you especially on later cycles when he has higher offense level via opportunistic or just the natural gain. A lot of Ego have a deceptively low offense level, so bear that in mind. Of course, So That No One Will Cry will use three of the So That No One Will Cry skill. One of these will be on the body, and two will be used by the right arm. 
If you have enough damage, you can redirect one of his Sona One Will Cry skills on the right arm all the way down the dashboard and instead rush to stagger the arm. This will cancel the need to clash with either of those skills, you would then only need to clash with the one skill on his body. You may end up taking some unopposed attacks, but so long as it is not the Sona One Will Cry skill hitting you, you should not take devastating damage. After you get past the first turn he uses the Sono and Will Cry skills, you should be at much higher sanity, and the rest of the fight should be no problem until you take him down. He will do the same 4 turn cycle for the rest of the fight, so there should be no unexpected factors to catch you off guard. Standout IDs for this fight will be Reindeer Ishmael and N. Claire. Despite Burn being transferred, a single skill 3 will do devastating amounts of damage from N. Claire, and Reindeer Ishmael has Mind Whip and all blunt skills for both of them. So exploiting that Wrath Blunt weakness means you can stagger his right arm far easier, especially with Mind Whip. You can also go for Sinking against this fight, since Refraction Railway likes to buff certain status conditions, and on this fight, you apply more Sinking and Count. So Spice Bushy Sang and Molar Ishmael will also do well, alongside a Rhyme Shanking Rodian if you feel so inclined. I'll give my thoughts on every abnormality after I talk about them, and what my personal experience was. So, for this fight, I used the end Faust Whistle strategy to brute force my way through this fight. The three other times I fought him, this fight was a snooze fest. I'm sorry, but I really have nothing else really interesting to say about him. It didn't help that I didn't use Reindeer Ishmael to lower the amount of time I spent on this fight, but every time I fought him after the first time, I was completely not paying attention. The first fight you do with him is interesting, just solely based on the fact that you have zero sanity, but then he quickly becomes the most uninspired fight in Railway. I'll also mention this now, since this is the section people are most likely to watch all the way through, but it would be impossible for me to mention every potentially good strategy for every fight, so I pass some of the work on to you all in the comments who have maybe done more runs than me or more limit testing than me. I would appreciate it a lot if you would help me help everyone else by saying what you did for certain fights or things I may have missed or, god forbid, gotten wrong. With that said, let's talk about Steam Transport Machine. So this fight is the definition of annoying, but not too hard. I actually really like the mechanic here, conceptually, where he switches from defensive to offensive depending on how many turns have passed in the railway as a whole. On odd numbers, he gains 3 damage up and 3 fragile on both parts, and on even numbers, he gains 3 protection and 3 damage down. The idea of this fight is to break his steam blaster part, which will then cause any poise he gains to be converted into fragile for the rest of the fight. Then you want to nuke down as much of his health as possible on his body in one turn. The reason for this is after you break his body, all of his damage type and sin weaknesses become ineffective next turn, meaning you deal a quarter of the damage you normally would for the rest of the fight. So, in an ideal world, you break his Steam Blaster, then wait for an odd turn so he has the fragile from the passive, then hit him with as many Envy nukes as possible. I would say as many Sloth nukes as possible, since he is fatal to Sloth instead of just weak, but there are far more Envy nukes in the game than Sloth, but once Olga Otis comes out, she will do very well in this fight, as well Daiichi Rodian does well. However, this fight ramps up as more turns pass, and therefore as more cycles pass. By ramps up, I mostly mean that it takes a lot longer. When he has 50 plus accumulated past, which accumulated past is just equivalent to the amount of turns gone by, Steam Transport Machine will hear for 200 health when he is below 80%. Thankfully, this translates to the other part of his passive being relatively tame, where when at 80 plus accumulated past, he gains an attack power up and an extra slot. So once the accumulated past is spent on healing, the actual fight section will get easier. In terms of strong IDs and strategies, charge. Just use charge. Warp Dawn, Warp Yoshu, and Rabbit Heathcliff, all Envy Nukes, health goes bye-bye. Faust's Hex Nail is also very useful, especially when corroded, as it will add on even more damage for those skills if your Faust goes quickly. This is where Lobotomy Remnant Faust really shines. Another way of approaching this fight is via statuses. Since your actual attacks will be dealing less damage, you can try to use the flat damage over time of effects like Bleed and Burn. However, Bleed and Burn are capped at 30 on this fight, so Rupture is your best option if you do not have access to the nuclear bombs that are the charge IDs. Rupture is set damage that is not associated with a sin affinity, and therefore will always deal good set damage. This is unlike Sinking, which, while it is boosted for this fight, deals gloom damage, meaning you will only deal half damage with it, and Steam Transport Machine always is ineffective against gloom. Sinking will still be alright overall, but I cannot recommend it here. Now, what was my personal experience on this fight? 
Well, my first run through, I liked the concept, but quickly started hating the execution because you had to do this fight so many times. However, to give my full thoughts on this fight, I need to make a confession. So I made a community post a while back that had this screenshot. And I asked you all what you thought this team was meant to be for. Most of you were confused by Spice Bushy saying on this team specifically, since almost every other ID is really terrible. But this team, and I assure you, is the worst railway team possible. I have been clearing railway with the seven worst IDs and the worst support passives possible for the past week I have been sick. I don't want to go into too much detail and ruin the surprises of this challenge, but just know that this has changed my perspective on Steam Transport Machine entirely. Before I thought he was even kind of a cool concept, now I hate every part of him with every fiber of my being. As of recording this, I have fought him four times, and every single one of those fights has been 20 plus turns of miserable clashing and dealing around 100 damage per turn. This fight is awful. However, it can be somewhat fun if you manage to nuke him down properly. I can see the potential satisfaction, and I had it myself, but really, come on. The gimmick of the fight should have stayed all throughout. Instead of being ineffective for the entire rest of the battle, he should have swapped between being ineffective and fatal against everything, staying with the same gimmick as before. I have no idea why they decided to make this so awful. So, Drifting Fox is a fight that doesn't really have much strategy to it. The Fox will start the fight with a certain amount of protection that will increase per cycle. Then after three turns, it will summon Umbrellas, lower your sanity, and punish you hard for attacking it via a new Thorns mechanic. From there, it is a rinse and repeat type fight, where the only main focus is getting rid of the Umbrellas as soon as possible. It is worth noting the amount of Umbrellas summoned will also increase per cycle, slightly increasing the difficulty each time outside of the protection and universal buffs. Really, this fight is just about dealing as much damage as possible, like every fight in Railway, and playing smart with the Umbrellas. The Fox lowering your sanity by 20 on the turn where he summons the Umbrellas sounds really scary, until you remember that the Umbrellas are level 35, meaning you gain sanity from defeating them, so once you defeat all the Umbrellas, everyone should be topped off for the next round where the Fox uses a big mass attack. So you should be able to easily clash that with Ting Tang Hong Lu's Mutilate, similar high rolling skills, or a powerful Ego. That's honestly about it. This fight should cause no real issues, besides being a bit of a time waster, because it has protection for two turns and punishes you very hard for attacking it on the third turn, meaning killing this quickly is a bit of a struggle. Zweigregor does great here, since his skills align very nicely with the sin affinity and damage type weaknesses of Drifting Fox. Just be careful tanking with him, as a Zweigregor with Leisure Domain equipped is four times weak to slash sloth skills, which Drifting Fox just so happens to have. Other than that, it's the usual suspects who will do particularly well, minus the blunt damage dealers to an extent. Just try to break the head, as that one has less HP, and once you break it, you'll be doing fatal damage, and then lay into it. This is the last of the fights I actively dislike, and it is a shame they put the least interesting and most grindy fights at the beginning, since you have to do them the most out of any of the fights in Railway. This fight would be fine if it weren't for the protection. It serves next to no purpose, really, besides being an arbitrary roadblock to slow you down. After the Drifting Fox fight, you've completed your first cycle. Good job. You'll take the opportunistic debuff, and now let's talk about the buffs you can choose for yourself. Again, this is very much team dependent, but generally you'll want to take the Sin Affinity boosts or the status boosts. The Sin Affinity boosts are a very strong plus 20% damage to all skills of that Sin type, meaning if you are running a charge team which has three Envy nukes, take the plus 20% Envy damage. It's really strong. You can also take that charge buff, which is also very strong, and makes Dawn Teleport practically not needed. Do bear in mind you cannot pick the same buff twice in a row, however what you can do, say you're using a charge team, is go Envy or charge buff first, then the one you didn't take, and then from there more Envy is preferred, though you can also take another charge buff, or you can take Slash. Other than that, if you're using a completely jumbled up team composition with no clear synergy, just take the Sin Affinity you have the most strong skills with. You could even take the damage type boost instead if you have a lot of any of the three, though they are a smaller 10% boost. There is no set guide on what is best here, so just pick what you think is best. It'll probably be fine, so long as it is not completely worthless like taking Tremor. Now that you've gone through everything again, you get to T-Core, and lucky you, these guys are pushovers. 
T Corp tried to be similar to the nightmare that was K Corp in Railway 1, but they fall flat. The only thing to bear in mind here is to not bring Blunt, Sloth, and Wrath skills, and play around their passive. The good thing is, if you have a semi-competent team composition, you can simply nuke one T-Core guy, then the other, since there's only two of them. Now, this fight does get marginally harder when we loop back to it on Cycle 3, since it gains a wave, but these are just more of the same easy enemies. This is one of the most free fights in all of Railway, so you can think of it as a breather. Since these guys are weak to Pierce, Rabbit Heathcliff does exceptionally well, alongside Ting Tang Hong Lu with Shank. You want to kill these guys and make sure they stay down, so going for overkill damage will be what saves you turns in the long run. t Core members take extra damage and count from burn, but burn is slow, so I can't recommend you bring Liu IDs for this fight specifically, especially since they resist Blunt and Wrath. Wait, why are these guys burn weak? You are punished so hard for running the burn IDs here. Ugh. Regardless, these guys also have very high stagger thresholds, meaning it doesn't take much to make them fatal to everything. So once you get a feel for how much damage you'll deal to them, making sure they don't recover health should be no problem. On my railway run, I only had these guys come back to life once, and it was also at that point that I realized they had the passive. So uh, these guys were really easy. I like the fight though. I really hope we get T-Core IDs in the future. Gregor with an arm cannon would be beautiful. Easy fight through and through, but also kind of fun, because you're not limited in the damage you can do via protection. Yep, another cycle reset right after that. It's annoying, but now you go back and do all these fights again so soon. Either way, now is a fine time to pick up Accelerating as your debuff, as well as another buff. Remember, you cannot pick the same buff twice in a row, so pick something complementary to what you chose before. If you chose the charge buff before, pick up the Envy boost now. Again, it's mostly up to you though. You can take whatever you want, and you'll generally be okay. So, remember how I said that Steam Transport Machine was annoying? As this Reddit user puts it, uh, yeah, uh, people don't like this fight. Essentially, three or four of your sinners will start off charmed, based on what cycle you're on. It will always grab the three or four slowest ones, then Fey Lantern will use unopposed attacks against the charmed allies, with no way to stop it, unless you kill the fairy body part quick enough. So yeah, this is kind of RNG reliant, which is unfortunate. Thankfully, this abnormality is weak to Lust, which is abundantly common, though resisting Pierce is unfortunate for the likes of Rabbit Heathcliff. This is where Zweigregor does a great job, and I would recommend setting up his skills so he has flexible suppression. Fate Lantern is slash weak, so having as many attacks as possible that use slash is key. Do bear in mind that it endures damage from gluttony attacks and Gloom is ineffective, meaning Gregor's slash attacks will deal less damage, but it's all about him being very fast, meaning he will usually be able to deal Decent to very good damage. This is a fight I want to mention some specific ego on, however. Not the ones I mentioned at the beginning of the video, though. What is cast? Rodian's base ego is incredibly good here, as it is both high rolling and pride and slash, meaning it will do a lot of damage. Yasunyata, not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Otis's Teth ego is lust and slash. They have to not run the sun shower ego, but... This will do very well, and 7 Otis is incredibly fast. Dimension Shredder Hong Lu is another Pride Slasher. Fourth Match Flame, all of them are Slash, so those will do very well. Just commit to this fight as much as you want, because having a go on long is terrible. Speaking from experience. After the fairy is destroyed, Fey Lantern will pop up, and you can actually damage it. You'll also gain quite a bit of poise from the fairy meaning this fight takes less time since you'll likely be critting a bunch once you can actually attack Fey Lantern. Ideally, you stagger Fey Lantern as soon as it is exposed, allowing you to deal massive damage or even kill it due to increased damage from poise. Fey Lantern will only stay exposed for one turn, so it will go back underground and recharm your allies if not staggered or killed. But the fairy will have more HP so long as the body is alive. This fight really is a DPS check, literally all throughout. Bring as many Pride and Lust skills as possible, alongside Slash skills. Standout IDs are any reliable fast IDs with Blunt or Slash skills that are not Gloom. Pretty general, but this is what you want. I find that even pure skills, so long as they were Lust or Pride, are enough to break the Fairy the first time. From there, you can just nuke to the high stagger threshold, and then the fight should be relatively simple. Personally, I liked this fight. Outside of the fact that I was using very fast IDs that were not optimal for killing the fairy fast. 
not once did my Warp Ryoshu not get charmed, which is a real shame since she destroys the fairy with almost any of her skills. Something I really need to point out about these fights are the animations in between. Whenever Fey Lantern emerges from the ground, it plays a short animation, and it does a lot to add to the grandeur, I suppose. These are abnormalities we're fighting, and it's been a while since abnormalities have felt... weighty. Frustrating as this fight can be, it's one of my favorites aesthetically and conceptually. I even think the execution is pretty well done, if a little punishing. Now notice how I said, I liked this fight. Emphasis on the liked part of I liked this fight. I wrote this script before I started my worst IDs run, and let's just say this fight is not very fun in that run. I'll talk about it more once I release that video, or maybe I'll stream my Cycle 4 experience, who knows. This fight is fun with good IDs, and absolutely miserable with bad IDs, and especially ones with not many slash skills. Shock Centipede can honestly be a very straightforward fight, especially since this is another fight that is present in both Kanto 4 and Mirror Dungeon, so you should be at least vaguely familiar with the mechanics. I would personally recommend just attacking the head to get rid of self-charge as quickly as possible whenever he uses the coil-up guard. There are a few problems in this fight though, such as Envy being ineffective, meaning the best nukes are far less damaging here. Wrath is also endured, meaning Mind Whip and Self-Destructive Purge are also slightly nerfed. As well, if you use charge, you really don't want to get hit by this guy, as it punishes you by prolonging the fight via self-charge. There is also that mass attack. This is a very scary attack, since it rolls high and gains clash power by self-charge. My recommendation would be to clash this attack last or as late as possible, since the centipede will use lots of skills that will give him charge on combat start. Bear in mind, combat start, meaning whatever you number you see on the mass attack will be increased by whatever self-charge he has on combat start. You want to clash and win against those first, since tense people lose self-charge on clash lose, making high voltage electric discharge more manageable to clash against, since it can get to some really high numbers if you don't deplete the self-charge from the first turn or from previous turns. Besides that, the most important thing here is to not get frustrated with this fight if it goes on for too long. If Centipede enters the phase where it is locked at 1 health, don't worry about it too much. Even if you are going for sub 200, you have plenty of wiggle room, so losing a few turns to Centipede is not the end of the world. Also, destroying the head will mean the Centipede gains less shield health the second time it uses Coil Up, so be sure you focus your extra damage on the head while it is attacking to ensure you can deplete the self charge. It's also weaker to more things, so it's the better part to attack anyways. Strong, blunt damage dealers will do well in this fight so long as you target the head, and for me personally, Sank Dawn did very well, but W Dawn is still absolutely the better ID for Railway overall. If you're a coward. The good thing about Centipede is that it is mostly about tactics and not necessarily the IDs you bring. This fight is a hard reading check, where the instinct is to attack the non-shielded part, the body, when you should at least damage the head a little to lower self-charge gain. Again, this is just what I did personally, as it makes the mass attack less daunting to clash against, and if you lose against it, it's basically a reset. It's a lot of damage. Especially if you are using charge IDs which are mostly blunt weak, and it will give him self charge back. Again, even going for sub 200, so long as you do the other fights decently well, you can afford some turns on Centipede. Sub 150, different story. But save yourself some resets by playing it a little safe. However, if you do want to bring a team of any kind, Sinking will do you well. Centipede is weak to Gloom, and has the Sinking debuff as part of Railway. So, I don't hate this fight. I did until I realized that just attacking the head meant you can bypass his one health nonsense, but now I don't think it's that bad. I do think that Brazen Bowl should have had this spot instead, as he could have been a much more interesting fight. There's not a lot of high clashers in Railway 2, so I think Bowl being an ego check could have been kind of cool, but I know a lot of people would disagree with me there. Either way, I would prefer a high-octane, fast, intense fight than one that can drag on and only really had one intimidating aspect, in this case, the mass attack. It's at this point I would recommend taking a break, if you are doing this in one sitting. As fun as it is to rush content, Railway 2 was clearly not designed to be beaten in one sitting. Some will do it anyways, like me, but that is just my advice. For this pass, you want to take Thirsting. You should have plenty of ego resources at this point, and even if you don't, the plus one should not completely cripple you. If it does, there's probably something fundamentally wrong. Just remember, you do have ego. 
On my first run, I think I only used 20 Ego or so, and ended the railway with well over 100 resources for almost every sim. So use those resources if you think you need to. Save them if you don't. In terms of buffs, it is a good idea to double up on whatever Sin Affinity boost you might have taken first. Plus 40% damage is a lot for all of the Envy nukes in the game, and also for whatever other Sin Affinity you may have taken. So go through all six of those other fights again. This is when T-Core gets a second wave, I believe, and Fey Lantern charms one more Sinner, but you shouldn't have any problem with either of those. And now you'll find yourself in front of... probably the easiest fight in Railway. At least T-Core can stall turns. Fairy Gentleman is the most simple fight by far. I feel like I don't really need to give advice, just look at the weaknesses shown on screen and bring IDs that have those. Th that aside, just be sure to break the Fairy Wine when he offers it and let him hit your sinners that have tipsy. The one thing to be wary of in this fight is if two of his I'll take this attacks target the same sinner. It actually will deal damage and a lot of it. I have not seen this happen myself, but if it can happen, it is easily offset by simply redirecting with another sinner. If he does target three different people, you can just unleash unopposed attacks and ignore him for a quick kill, since he will stagger himself the next turn after he does those three attacks. An unbelievably easy fight. So Fairy Gentleman is weak to Envy and Wrath, so he dies very quickly from the usual suspects, stagger his right arm, then honestly throw whatever you got at him. So my thoughts? Well, I just really like Fairy Gentleman. He's a funny guy, so this fight was pretty much just like meeting your favorite uncle at a family reunion, but he gets too drunk so you have to beat him up, but still, it's a pleasant experience overall. Definitely one of my favorite fights, simply because... I mean, look at this guy. Come on. And yep, once again, only one new fight and another cycle. This is the cycle that upsets me quite a bit. It means you only fight Wayward Passenger once, at least if you're sane and only doing five loops. Doing a second full loop as your last one would make a lot more sense and be a little bit more fun in my opinion, even if it's slightly extended the railway overall. At this point, choosing Inhaling as your debuff is likely best. However, if you feel like you will struggle against Fey Lantern in particular, Hardening is okay to take. Fey Lantern can get really out of control with self-healing, so Hardening is the safer play, though it makes your railway far longer. The Fairy Gentleman slash Fairy Long Legs duo fight is the most fun fight in Railway, in my opinion, though it is still pretty simple. You should already be pretty familiar with how easy Fairy Gentleman is, and while Fairy Long Legs does make the fight significantly harder, he is not too complicated himself. The main thing is just making sure you are managing your clashes and not taking too many unopposed attacks, or any at all, ideally. Breaking Fairy Long Legs' arm is your best bet dealing with him as it will give him an attack power down, and all of his body parts have the same resistance anyways, so there isn't any downside to not attacking the arm. It's also the body part that does attacks. After some turns, both Fairy Gentleman and Fairy Longlegs will summon their respective gimmick, the Giant Clover in Fairy Longlegs' case. During this turn, be sure you destroy the Fairy Wine and leave the Clover alive for at least one turn. Fairy Longlegs should keep countering so long as the Clover is alive, so you do not have to worry about him for a little while, from here, you deal with Fairy Gentleman's tipsy gimmick once more, and then you can choose to destroy the Clover, or keep it around if you don't care about the attack power-up it gives to the fairies. Just be sure to not let Fairy Gentleman get off any of his healing attacks, or hit you if you took the Inhaling debuff, since they will gain HP healing up from the Clover, meaning Fairy Gentleman can heal a lot more health. Other than that, you should have this fight in the bag once one of the fairies go down. Pretty simple. Oh, funny thing. Yeah, this guy dies really hard to rip space and DDEDR. The only problem is juggling Fairy Gentleman on top of that, but that really isn't too bad. Bring a mix of Slash and Pierce skills, and you'll do just fine here so long as you remember your mechanics. Like I said at the beginning, this is my favorite fight in Railway. These two are just really fun abnormalities, so fighting them together was a good time. I wish you didn't only do this fight once. It was challenging in a fun way, and I would not have minded doing this twice at all. My only problem is the obsession with protection when enemies use defensive skills, like when Fairy Longlegs counters. He gains 9 protection, meaning there is zero reason to attack him. Which is fine, I guess, but there seems to be a lot of these mechanics present in Railway as a whole, and I just wish this wasn't the case. If you're going to put a counter on something, that's already a deterrent to not attack them. So adding the protection on top of it is just double layers of protection, no pun intended, for seemingly no reason. It's just strange. Now the last non-boss fight of the railway. 
Wayward Passenger is a visually fantastic fight. However, from my experience, by god is he underwhelming. Am I the only one who took this guy down in only a few turns on my first go? His stagger thresholds on his blades are super high, meaning you can very easily cripple him early on. If there is one thing to not be taken lightly, it is his counter. I'm going to talk about something I do not talk about often enough on this channel, and that is Ego Sin Resistances. A lot of people do not think of this mechanic, but sinners are weak to certain sins based on their Zayn level Ego by default. Do you know how many of those Zayn Ego are fatal to Gluttony? Four. Forest for the Flames, Body Sack, Representation Emitter, and Chains of Others. Three of those four you must have equipped, and for Ryoshu, Forest for the Flames is much better than Soda. It is very likely you are running a Faust, Heathcliff, and Ryoshu on your railway team, so I would recommend being very careful, since this Gluttony Slash counter can absolutely destroy an end Faust, or to a lesser extent, a Rabbit Heathcliff. Warp Ryoshu does resist Slash, but it will still deal massive damage, especially because by this point, enemies are dealing plus 40% more damage. So be very wary of who attacks Wayward first on a turn where he has the counter. Do note, the counter will only go off when you attack the body part that has the counter on it, so bear that in mind when determining which sitter you want to take that counter to the face. Other than that, eventually he will create four rifts. If you can destroy all these on the same turn, which is highly recommended, Wayward Passenger becomes a complete pushover, since his stagger thresholds will raise even higher. If you cannot defeat the rifts, he will gain the bonuses listed beneath them. The only two that really matter in my opinion was more max HP and coin power. So if you really have no AoE Ego to spare, aim for those first, and this fight should still go down easy. If you are doing this fight on the fourth cycle as you should be, the funny high speed rip space move that's been going around should not be a concern, since it is not used until it weighs into the fight, and is only super dangerous to clash against if you haven't been destroying rifts. Lastly, if you are struggling with this high speed at the start of the fight, you can always retry the fight until he is not targeting the same sinner twice. It is a bit frustrating, as I had to do this myself on the first run of Wayward, but it is better than having to take unopposed attacks, since by this point enemies deal a lot more damage, like I said. Don't overthink this fight. It throws a lot of mechanics at you, but few of them actually matter, so long as you're dealing enough damage to take him down quickly. And even if you don't, a prolonged fight should not be the end of you. There aren't any particularly strong IDs here, since he isn't weak to any damage type, only sin affinities. I would say the most important thing is having a relatively healthy or tanky sinner who is not slash and or gluttony fatal to take the counter if possible, since that is the most tricky part of the fight, in my opinion. Other than that, the usual charge IDs are going to be a little bit weaker than normal, simply due to Wayward Passenger heavily resisting Envy, but you can still absolutely get by. Personally, I was underwhelmed by this fight, as I alluded to. The visuals were great, and I love how funny he looks, but no one really struggles with this fight outside of the counter, and no one really talks about it since this is one of the two fights you only do once in a 5 cycle run, with the other being the final boss, which is obviously talked about. So while I don't dislike any aspect of this fight, besides the counter being a little scummy and preventing high loop runs, I do wish Wayward Passenger lived up to his hype a little bit more than what we got. That being said, by the time I'm recording this, I have not gotten to Wayward Passenger in my worst IDs run. I imagine my opinions might change. This is the last rotation that sane managers will have to do. Take your last debuff, and for a buff, if you really need it, healing is not a bad choice for the fight that's coming up, but more damage is always great as well. But if you made it here, pat yourself on the back. You're in the home stretch, and all you have left is Sign of Roses. First of all, you should just do this fight yourself. In my opinion, this is not a really difficult fight, and it's pretty cool to do it yourself for the first time, so long as you read. So I will highly recommend that if you are looking at this video for advice and watch it all the way to here, thanks for watching by the way, subscribe and all that, but at least try this fight first. Be sure to read up on its mechanics, and then if you are still struggling, come back here. Alright, now that like, maybe one person followed my advice and has gone to do the fight, let's talk about Sign of Roses. As the fight starts, you can attack the flesh right off the bat. The reason for this is that it has less health, and destroying it takes away from Sign of Roses' overall health leading to a faster kill. After the mass attack is used, a colored rose will spawn corresponding to each sinner's skill 1, Sin Affinity. Most of these roses have relatively harmless effects, or just like to try and stick around however they can. Except for the Wrath Rose, which will deal damage back to you when you kill it, so try to minimize the amount of IDs with the Wrath skill 1 you bring into this fight. For every turn a rose lives, the sinner corresponding to that rose loses 25% of max HP. The sinner that each rose is attached to is listed on the bottom in a small little icon. You have to read a little bit to get there, you can do it. 
In addition, the roses will drain your ego resources for every turn that they are alive, corresponding to the sin affinity color they are. After three turns of a rose being left alive, the bonded sinner will die. That is about it, but there are a few more things to note. When given the abnormality choice, choose to accept. Then choose whichever sin affinity is your most common. After doing the check, you deal and take 10% more damage of that sin affinity you chose. Choosing decline is never really worth it, as I believe it just makes you more tanky, which we don't care about. The main thing here is that flat damage. So taking less damage overall, who cares? The roses are ineffective against all sin types except for the color that they are, so bear this in mind when trying to take them down as efficiently as possible. AoE Ego will also work well, but even if one of your sinners die, it is not the end of the world. In my first run, I lost my Warp Ryoshu because I was stupid, and the fight was still over very quickly. Sign of Roses itself gets weaker and weaker to Sins of the Roses you destroy, though it is a small amount, and you should have more than enough damage to take down Sign of Roses after two cycles of Roses have passed. This fight should really only be difficult if you do not have Fluid Sack Pursuance or some other form of full party healing like Sinclair's Impending Day on Kill. Pay attention to which sinners will still be alive by the end of your skills, do some math, and be sure to keep your low health sinners alive as long as possible by focusing their roses first. If you took healing from the last railway buff and can keep up with the roses enough to kill them, this fight should be one of the easiest in railway. I know it was for me. Standout IDs are Spice Bushy Sang. Fitting because of the, you know, flowers and all that, but if you have Sun Shower Ego, that plus his passive will help destroy more roses faster, which is always a good thing. Other than that, try to avoid bringing Wrath skill 1 IDs. Rabbit Heathcliff can afford to sit this fight out. He will likely cause more harm than good, though I kept him around, it's not that big of a deal. Now, what do I think of Sign of Roses? Well, I do think this fight is cool, but ultimately I was slightly underwhelmed for a final boss. Take MFE or My Form Empties. Going into that fight for the first time and seeing it was a wow level threat alongside the creepy music was an atmosphere that was deserving of a final boss. Sign of Roses took a different approach, more of a serene uneasiness. While this was effective in its own right, I still think My Form Empties had the better impact by far. The Rose mechanic is a little bit of a boring DPS check in a railway that was already so full of DPS checks. It's also interesting how both final bosses we have experienced for railway imply that the abnormality itself isn't that threatening. Simply what it summons is what makes it so dangerous. All this to say, I did enjoy the fight. It was not bad. I simply wished it had something more to it. After you've conquered the Sign of Roses, you're done. Claim your rewards and never look back. Unless you want the cool banners, or you hate yourself. I fall into both of those categories. This ends the guide portion of the video. I hope I covered every fight in sufficient enough detail to help you all through Railway, or maybe you just thought it'd be interesting to hear me talk about the fights. But now, I'll talk about my thoughts on Railway as a whole, so if you don't care to hear that, by all means, this video ends now. For the rest of you, let me talk about my conclusions on Railway as a whole. If I had to summarize my thoughts into a phrase, I would say this railway was a mixed bag. Redoing Talisman Doll, Steam Transport Machine, and Drifting Fox four or five times was the exact opposite of fun. They seriously put the most dull and or long fights at the beginning, which is really unfortunate. Now, would swapping any other fights at the beginning help? Maybe, however, the point remains that doing the same fights again and again is not very fun. I'm recording this after editing all the rest of this video, and I'm currently sitting on cycle 4 of my worst IDs run, and as I hear more and more negative criticism of Railway 2, the more I am inclined to agree. The fights drag on, some of the fights demand a very specific team composition, the Fey Lantern. The worst thing about the Railway though is putting those interesting fights so far down the line. To fight Wayward Passenger, you need to do more than 30 fights I believe. That is ridiculous. Railway 1 had its own problems, mainly the Snake Inquisitor's fight that was just miserable, but looking at that now, the fights we had here are not much better. Steam Transport Machine could be considered about as bad. I do think the challenge of high loops is interesting, but since the sinners do not scale nearly as well as the enemies do, you fall behind quickly, leading to an abominable uphill battle. However, doing my worst IDs run has also given me some seriously good perspective. This content is fascinating because it is truly an endurance test if you want it to be. For people using the best teams, 
the five cycles are less of an endurance test and more of a race. And while that is fine and is fun in its own way, look at the footage I'm running in the background. This is cycle three centipede. Every turn takes a long time to sort out. Part of that is because aggro is terrible for me because it's slow speed, but I'll get into that when I release the video on the worst IDs maybe beating railway. Don't even know if it's possible yet. But personally, I miss that complexity from Ruina a lot. Fighting the later receptions could take an hour plus. Figuring out the right combinations of things to do is fun for me. While Limbus is more limiting, there is a surprising amount of depth to be found in its dumbed down mechanics. I would not make videos on Limbus if I did not fully enjoy those mechanics. Though of course, there is the matter of RNG, and RNG is less and more present here on Railway 2 compared to Railway 1. Less because there is no resetting for skills and speed, and more because there's no resetting for skills or speed. You have less control over what you can do, so you do end up having to reset more when things go your way. As in, later into the fight. Before, you wouldn't even start a fight until you had an optimal setup. I do think I prefer the Railway 2 way still, but just barely. The abundance of skill 1s make IDs like Enclair a lot less fun to use, but it also makes IDs like Saint Don more fun to use. It really does kind of balance out in the end. I made my thoughts on the cycles pretty apparent, I think, but come on, we should have only had three cycles. Four, I guess, if you're going to say that Sign of Roses is an entire other cycle. Make there be three really interesting debuffs, and less buffs, but far more interesting. I'm sure I can make a whole video designing Railway 3 and what I would like to see ideally, so if you all want to see that, let me know, though I have a ton of projects backed up now since I fell behind on videos due to being sick. Overall, I think the problems with Railway can be summarized pretty easily. Think of the Sign of Roses fight. Now, some of you may have struggled immensely with this fight and hated it. However, despite me thinking it was worse than my form empties, the feeling of this fight is what matters the most. It's what drags you in and gets you invested. It makes you slow down, and therefore, you're more immersed. This feeling is created partially because it is the final boss, but also partly due to the environment and tone the fight chooses to take. This is the kind of feeling I want from that kind of content. And it does have its moments where it does that, more so than Railway 1 had, I would say. I hate to say it, but more fights should be like Fae Lantern and less like Steam Machine. The first time you fight Steam Machine might be interesting, but every subsequent time, it was going through the motions. While this may have been the intention, it is not fun. Fae Lantern was always at least somewhat exciting to see and to fight, even if RNG can be a cruel mistress, especially there. I do think the animations added a lot to it. Small things like that can go a long way in creating an interesting fight, at least visually, and that's half of it. All of this to say, I did enjoy this railway. Was it frustrating, and is it frustrating? Yes. Were some of its mechanics overbearing and anti-fun? Absolutely. Do I necessarily want to run this for speed? No. I think undeniably my passion of a low turn count has been lessened by the length of this railway. Do I still think the first time through is a good experience, though? Mostly. This thing is entirely subjective. I have seen people hate the railway, and I have seen people who love this railway. I think both are equally valid. However, I would like to see the first railway return, most of all. It was a better testing ground for IDs than most anything we have now. I hope that rant was sufficient for you all, but knowing some people who watch me, I will still be told this rant was not enough, I need to make a three hour video ranting about Ishmael. But that would be crazy to do. That is all for me. I'm exhausted from editing. I really hope you enjoyed the video and or learned something. And as always, this video ends shortly.